avanti. predictability and climate change and the foundation of statistical mechanics uh, and the natural scientific models and theories and so today you will give us uh, a best introduction to uh, scientific modeling and so thank you Roman thank you so much for having me and thank you for coming can you all hear me yes. Yes. good yes. If my voice fades and you can't hear me, just shout. You know. Generally, if you have clarificatory questions, you don't understand something, what I say, or something's unclear, or m my English is too muddled, just raise your hand, just um, interrupt immediately. So I don't want to lose you. Anyway. For the heavy debates, maybe wait till later, because otherwise you never get to the end of the lecture. But if something's unclear, just, just let me know. Okay, so here is the starter, and that's sort of the simple factual observation that models matter in many scientific contexts. Oops. Uh, here are a few of my favorite examples. So it's the Schelling model of social segregation, the Fibonacci model of population growth, the billiard ball model of a gas, the Bohr model of the atom, the Lorentz model of the atmosphere, the lot Cavalterra model of predator-prey interaction, you could continue till midnight here, so if you <laughs> make your list of um, favorite models. So models are important in science. So, and I think that makes them a legitimate um, subject matter for philosophical reflection. However, the sobering message is to come right now. If you then ask, well, what is a model? The picture is rather confusing. And if you're confused, you're in good company. Here is Nelson Goodman, uh, who says in Languages of Art, few terms are used in popular and scientific discourse more promiscuously than model. A model is something to be admired or emulated, a pattern, a case in point, a type, a prototype, a specimen, a mock-up, a mathematical description, almost anything from a naked blonde to a quadratic <laughs> equation. <laughs> so, there you go. But the aim of this lecture today is to, to try to impose a little bit of order in this mess and sort of have to disappoint you, the naked blondes will fall out of the picture on the next slide, but I hope that even the other models I have for you are of some interest. So, the so a bit of linguistic anthropology here. So here are a number of senses of models that I discard right away because they're not relevant for the context I'm interested in. So this is when you talk of the model student. This is the student who does everything right. It is an example to be followed. So you can obviously speak in this way, but that's not the sort of models I'm interested in. Claudia Schiffer is probably the category of the blondes, so the beautiful creatures presenting fashion, so that's models in a different way. So little Jimmy's model railway, 
when we talk about models in this sense, a model is a toy, I set that aside, or the Ford T model. So here model means a particular kind of product, or sometimes you hear scientists say, well, this is just a model. And so if this is a sloppy way of saying, we're not quite sure about this, and this is a tentative result, and this is the subject matter of further study. So you, there you use model to express effectively the epistemic um, caution. But that's a good thing to express epistemic caution, and you can do that in model language, but that's also not what I'm interested in, so you could do that in Bayesian probabilities and something like that. So I set all that aside. So what I'm interested in are scientific models, and then the question is, what do you mean by that? I mean, I've mentioned a few. Just let's make a little poll. Have you ever been exposed to any scientific models, or the models that you would classify as scientific you have been exposed to? Standard model. The standard model? <laughs> Why? I actually should have put the standard model. <laughs> The standard model is a difficult one because the standard model is actually what you would call a theory. Uh, but we, we, we can come back to that later. And yeah, but. So if you want to go into that part of saying maybe you would have said the Young Mills model or something like that, it's more specific. But we, what I'm going to talk about a bit later is exactly the uneasy relationship between models and theories. Yeah? Excuse me, could, could you raise your voice, please? What? Should I try to use the microphone? So Thank yeah. you. Maybe. Yeah, better? Better. <laughs> yeah, somehow I feel like a talk master now. <laughs> okay, let me try. So, in case my microphone slips, let me know again. Yeah. So, any other models? Have you ever encountered any models? Okay, you will encounter one very soon. So here is a model I want to go through with you in a little bit of detail, and that's the model of the growth of a population. And so the question is, if you get a pair of newborn rabbits, how many rabbits will you have at the later point in time? And so uh, I want to do a little exercise here, so to take three to five minutes, think about how you would go about this um, question. How would you answer this question? And I think in, um, I'm in a good Italian tradition here. Um, Enrico Fermi used to ask his students to answer questions like how many grasses are there on a the football field? Or how many trees are there um, in a forest? And so, so if you notice, the, the question is vague. And part of what you have to do, I tell you so much, is to disambiguate. So you have to engage with the question constructively. You can't just solve it algorithmically. So, so take three or five minutes, and then hopefully a few of you will volunteer to tell me how they have tried to solve this problem. And just to put your mind at ease, there's no one right way to go. So there's many ways to go. There's many ways to um, grow flowers, and there are many ways to build models, so, so don't worry, you won't be just wrong. So um, please take a few minutes and then we discuss your results and then I tell you how one famous person solved this problem.
Given it away, the crucial name was already on the first slide. But uh, so, bracketing the great Fibonacci. So, how how would you go about solving this problem? Or if you haven't got any solutions, what puzzles you? I mean, what problem are you running up against? Yeah. <clears throat> so I thought you you might bring Fibonacci into the picture. So I thought really to take your advice and think about it independently yeah. of my knowledge or whatever I retain from high school about Fibonacci, I thought there are actually, if, if it should be realistic, there are many um, variables that probably don't figure, as far as I remember, in Fibonacci's mm -hmm. model. So, so you gave us the um, number of the population at the start, mm -hmm. but then like the, the rate of fertility, the duration of puberty, the, the rate of mortality, the distribution of sex among the offspring, well, I mean, and then the duration of observation, and I mean, if it's realistic, there are many factors that probably would figure in such a model. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, so you're pointing in exactly the right direction. So the first thing you have to do is you have to get clear on what variables are you using, what parameters you put in your model, and then you already brought up the issue of realism. If you build a population model with all the factors that you did, you need a model computer to solve the equations you get. But that's exactly, you have to sort of to identify parameters and then you have to probably throw away a lot of them or make simplistic assumptions so you can calculate something. There was something in the back, yeah? I was, I was thinking that you used this uh, particular picture just because we have uh, a common knowledge that uh, rabbits are uh, known for having a high uh, birth rate. So I was thinking you use it, used it to tell us what a model can, what, what uh, problem can, can, can create a model. Because if the model 
gives you an, uh, a wrong idea of what can go wrong or go right in a particular situation, you can have a, a misleading uh, conception mm -hmm. of the reality. Yeah. yeah, that you can have as well. But So the other question is, of course, if you have a model that works for rabbits, and does it work for birds, or does it work for humans? Uh, that's, the, that's the problem of the scope of validity at the end. But yeah, thank you. That, that, that's great. These are some of the issues you're running up against. And so I suppose if you hinted at So the first thing is to realize that this is not a, a well-defined problem in the sense that there is just a right or wrong answer to it. So you have to think the situation through. What I want to do now is um, give you the idea of how Fibonacci did it. But I want to do it a bit more in a more detailed way than you typically find it in a textbook. So I want to make the basic assumption in the model clear, coming back to your point, that we really must understand what the parameters are. And that's what modeling, that the activity of scientific modeling is really all about. So this is Fibonacci, that's a statue in Pisa, in the dome. So, great mathematician of the Middle Ages. So, um, what's at least implicit in Fibonacci? Uh, the following assumption. So, the rabbit pair is one male and one female, and both are heterosexual. So, well, it may sound trivial, but homosexuality I mean, animals is actually rather widespread, as I'm told by evolutionary anthropologists. So, you have this assumption. Well, that's not stated in if I just ask you how many rabbits you have if you get two rabbits. But you have to say, well, are they actually such that they mate and can have offspring? So the rabbits are able to reproduce the first time six months after birth. I mean, so it's also something you alluded to. So you must say something about how long puberty is, etc. Then you assume that they re reproduce from every six months after you have them. Then you assume that they mate immediately after the female gave birth. Now you may not get terribly nervous about these assumptions. Okay, so they're getting a bit wilder now. So you assume that every female gives birth to exactly one male female pair of rabbits, which satisfies assumptions one or two before. Then you say that there is no limitations on living space, there's no limitations on food supplies, and then you assume that your rabbit, rabbits never die, so then you have reached um, immortality, at least with the rabbits, and they keep up their six months birth rhythm indefinitely. So you say, look, I'm making these assumptions, and under these assumptions, I can now answer the questions you brought up before. But here is how it goes. So at moment zero, the rabbits are born. You have one rabbit pair. Let's call that pair A. Six months later, they've just been growing up. You still have one rabbit pair, pair A. And 12 months later, you still have rabbit pair A, but here they have produced offspring. So they have, they have a second rabbit pair after 12 months. Because you, you recall, one of the modeling assumptions we made is that they take six months until they can reproduce, and then it takes them six months to, to produce one pair of offspring. So you have two pairs here. Then you continue. So this pair is just growing up. This pair persists, and it adds another pair. And now you see how the game continues. I mean, all rabbit pairs that have been around for long enough keep reproducing. And so on and so on. So now you can count your rabbit pairs and you get number one, two, three, five, and so on. So let's just re redesign the slide a bit. So that's exactly the same thing again, just a bit smaller, so I can squeeze other things around it. So. This is a sequence of number, that's the number of rabbit pairs. <coughs> and now just uh, rather than calling it after six months, after twelve months, it's just a bit cumbersome to speak in this way. This is just changing terminology. We call this the moment T0, T1, T2, T3, etc. And 
let's call these numbers here the number at t0, the number at t1, the number at t2, etc. That's just sort of a form of notation to refer to these numbers. And now you look at this, and th that was Fibonacci's great insight. He said, look, when you add up these two, you get the next. And same here, you add up these two, you get the next. You add up these two, you get the next. So that's in fact how it continues. So the general law is that the population number at a certain moment, ti, is the population number at ti minus 1 plus the number at ti minus 2. So basically you take the two previous ones and you get the current one. So that's the simple idea and that gives you a sequence here is how it looks it's 1 1 2 3 5 8 13 21 34 55 89 144 what you see here that this starts growing very quickly uh, so this is uh, that's um, just a little interlude that has become part of a popular culture even you may recognize the city of Turin and if you zoom in a little bit here that's a famous tower in Turin, and there is an art installation on it with the Fibonacci numbers. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm just an aside. Uh, let's get back to the Fibonacci numbers. So, this sequence now has the following properties. So after five years, you have 89 rabbit pairs. The population grows monotonically, so the population never goes down, it keeps increasing. There's no bound to the population size, so you don't reach a plateau. It goes up and up and up. And in fact, there's the growth speed increases. It grows faster and faster and faster. So the worry is, um, what can you infer about real rabbits from that? I mean, this has also came out in both the comments we had before. And that's effectively the problem of representation. Notice that most of the model assumptions are simply false, some more dramatically than others. So the for six months birth rate is not such a bad assumption, but that rabbits never die is hardly realistic. So um, there is an issue how to deal with that. And this brings us to the first important insight here, namely that models are not just a description of facts. So models are we come to that later, what exactly we want to say they are, but they're sort of a creative act of uh, creating a parallel system, as it were, that bears some sort of relation to the real thing, but it's not just a description of the real thing. So the model is not just a small copy of the big thing. And that's something to bear in mind that sometimes that gets forgotten in the heat of battle. So the question then is, how does the model relate to the real world? And what, if anything, does the model represent? And how does it do so? So would we want to say that this model represents real population of rabbits? Would we stretch it further to come back to your comment? Would we want to say it represents other populations? Does it po represent human populations? And just to some extent, yes. I've recently talked to a demographer and they say they run about five models when they want to know how a population of a city grows. And one of them is, is Fibonacci. So they still use this in modern times to make predictions about the population of cities. So it's not completely wrong. I mean, even though the assumptions are wildly unrealistic, it doesn't make the model completely useless. And that's one of the characteristics of, of, of modeling that you you have unrealistic assumptions and you create sort of a parallel system, but the parallel system is not just a fancy idea. It is a fancy idea that bears interesting relation to reality. The question is to figure out what that is. So that's the first question that comes up in connection with models. And what I would want to do now is sort of give you sort of the run through the philosophical issues that arise in connections with with models and that philosophers who work on modeling work on. So the second is the ontological problem. So what is the model? So we've been talking about rabbits and assumptions and, and food supplies and whatnot, and we had an equation at some point. So what exactly is the model? What are we talking about when we talk about the Fibonacci model? So is it the equation? We 
have? Is it the sequence itself? Is it the set of assumptions we made? Or is it some sort of fictional population of rabbits that satisfy all the assumptions we made? Or, or is it a combination of all of these? So what is that thing we call model? But that's the ontological problem. Then there are issues with reference and truth. So what are we talking about? Or what are we referring to when we talk about the model? And it's also an important issue that there is truth in the model which is, which is independent from truth in the world. So there are certain things that are true in the Fibonacci model and that is independent of whatever happens in the world. So at some point you have 144 rabbit pairs, I think it's after, <coughs> after 10 or 12 weeks, I can't remember. So that's a fact about the model, and if you say it's 148, you just get it wrong. So the question, from a philosophical point of view, is how you analyze that. What notion of truth is it? It's sort of a different kind of truth than standard truth. When I say I've been born in Basel, that's not the same statement like when I say in Fibonacci's model, you get 144 pairs after 10 weeks. So what kind of truth is it? And this is a pressing issue because a good model always has truths that are not written into it. If you have a model in which just the basic assumptions that you write down at the beginning are true, well, you can still call it a model, but it's a very dull model. So you know, you're not really interested in that. So models, they have the characteristic of generating truths that have not been explicitly written into it. So if you rewind, you go to, to back to Fibonacci here. If you look at, a, at, our, at our assumptions, so you have the catalog of nine assumptions. More is true in the model than is explicitly stated in these assumptions. I mean, that's why we study it. I mean, if the model was nothing more than a collection of these assumptions, you would shrug your shoulder and say, yeah, and so what? So th this is of an interesting object of study because more is true in this in this object than you write home down explicitly. And that raises the question of well what kind of truth is it and how do you find out? That's the fourth problem, that's the epistemology of modeling. How do we learn about models and how do we learn about the truths that we find in the model um, that are not already explicitly written into it? How do we study and investigate the model? That's really the issue. The fifth is the issue that came up when you mentioned the standard model. So models are, of course, somehow related to theory. So I haven't mentioned theory yet, you may have noticed. So, but obviously we can't dodge the issue. So the question is, how do models relate to theory? So Fibonacci's model is pretty much independent of theory. We didn't mention any theory here, but we will see later. No, not all models are like this. I mean, some models have a heavy involvement of theory, and they are related to theory in a number of interesting ways. And the question is, what ways are these? How can models be related to theory? And well, I have to disagree point you right away that there's no, no need to answer to this. I mean, this in fact has been a subject matter of a lot of philosophical screaming and shouting, at least since the 1980s. People have written on this topic and had very different views on it. I'll try to give you some ideas later. But sort of this is a very, um, a very contentious issue, how models relate to theory. And finally, one can ask how other topics in philosophy of science relate to modeling, you can ask how models figure in scientific explanation, how models relate to realism. And the realism debate is often phrased in terms of theories. So should we take the theoretical posit of our best theory seriously? What happens to this thinking about the realism problem if you take modeling on board and you think a big part of science is modeling. I mean, what does that do to scientific realism? There's an interesting question there. And also, how do models relate to laws of nature, etc., etc., etc. You can basically take whatever topic in philosophy of science you like, and you, are, you ask, well, what is the bearing of models on that um, topic? So you can 
think through things from that point of view. So, so that's basically the panorama of philosophical problems that we're facing. Now, before delving into the more sort of abstract reflections on models, I want to give you a second example. It's also a nice, simple one. And so you worry about social segregation. And the question is, why do we see social segregation? And then even in a context where people are not explicitly racist or classist, I mean, if you have a society that's just I'm openly racist, you see why segregation happens. But it's a, it's a reality that segregation happens in contexts where people do not seem to be openly racist. Why, why does it happen? Now, an important attempt to grapple with that problem goes back to Thomas Schelling, who constructed an agent-based model of social segregation. And later I'm going to show you here on the screen a computer simulation. You find that on the server of Stanford University. So you can, you can go there and you can run it online. It's really nice. They have a nice tool there. So I'll show it to you later. You can also go there yourself. So the idea is, and you see something very similar to the Fibonacci case happens. I partially show you this model as well to show that I didn't just pick Fibonacci sort of carefully to make a few points. It's not representative. Well, it's still a small, small number reduction, I'm showing you two models, but at least you have another model where you see the same sort of thought processes in action. So you assume that there are only two kinds of agents, call them X and O. You already realize that's not realistic for a modern society. You don't just have two kinds of people. But that's your modeling assumption. That's like having, model, like having rabbits that don't die. So assume the city is a grid and assume the grid cells represent where people live and assume further that we start with a position where people are effectively placed randomly on the grid. You just throw people in the city randomly. And you leave a certain percentage of the grid cells white, which means that no one lives there. So at this place in town, someone of the X variety lives. At this part in town, someone of the O variety lives. And here, no one lives. And now we assume that people are very simple. They have a simple satisfaction rule. They are satisfied if at least a certain percentage of people around them are of the same kind. A part of what you can do in the online tool is you can change that percentage and you see how the segregation pattern depends on that percentage. So let's call P the satisfaction threshold. I then also assume that all agents have the same satisfaction threshold, so you can look at two concrete examples, and that's also from the Stanford um, website. So you can look at this corner here. So this agent is satisfied. If, so we, we assume you have a 50% you have a satisfaction threshold. So, because half of the neighbors are of the same kind as the agent itself. So, so this guy here is happy because his neighbors are one of the same kind and one of a different, that makes 50%, so fine. While this guy is not happy because only one neighbor is of the same kind and three are not. So, so this is someone who will change location later on. So yeah, that's exactly what comes now. If an agent is dissatisfied, she can move to any vacant location in the grid. And so the different instantiations of the model work this a bit differently. You can either randomly select the location where the agent jumps to, or you can take the ne nearest available location, so slightly different. And you assume that all dissatisfied agents must be moved at the same time and then the as a situation is reassessed. Uh, Roman, can I interrupt? Yeah. Being openly racist yeah. doesn't have anything to do with being satisfied. Because you may take them as contradicting yourself. In, In what way? way? Being non openly racist yeah. and being uh, satisfied or not satisfied. Yeah. So why would one be satisfied? in having someone of the same kind next, if you're not racist. 
Well, the, the assumption is simply that even if you're not racist, you have a mild preference to live with people of the same kind. So, so that's the assumption. Oh, oh, okay, so there is sort of the meta modeling is how to do it. Well, that is a sensible distinction, but sort of people who study social phenomena more, more closely than I do, they um, tell me that um, even people who are not racist, or who wouldn't consider themselves racist, who are not white supremacists or something like that, may have preferences of living in a neighborhood with the same kind of people. And I mean, kind is left open. It doesn't only have to be racial. It can be the same social class. You want to live in a decent middle class neighborhood where where all the daughters play the piano and um, something of that. So, I mean, they, they, they can be sort of whatever social markers you want to look at. It doesn't have to be skin color or something like that. It's just people of the same kind. And the model leaves it completely open what kind mean. Does that yeah, make sorry, great sense? No, 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 thanks. So, so the, the question Schelling poses himself is to explain why in society where there is no sort of explicit racism, you still get segregation. And there he says, look, people have preferences and they can be stronger or less strong. And the parameter that measures this is the satisfaction threshold. So if, you, it, I mean, if you're already dissatisfied, if a very low percentage of neighbors are not like you, you have a very strong preference to live with people like you. If you um, have a high threshold, you have a, have a milder preference. And so Schelling just takes it as a given that people have this preference. I mean, to some extent, we all have. I mean, I, 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 I have a strong preference not to live near people who play loud hip hop at two in the morning. So, so um, I mean, you see, all these things can, can, uh, can be factored in, yeah? Just a clarification yeah. question. So here it seems, given this additional assumption that there need to be enough empty slots in this grid to accommodate all the dissatisfied yeah. people in one yeah. round. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, and I mean, if you don't have, they just have to stay where they are, to stay dissatisfied. Um, again, you see, you're making a lot of assumptions that then raises the question, what does the model really um, explain? And does it really tell you something about why social segregation happens? And this is a matter of lively debate. I mean, there's no right or wrong answer. So people who worry about social segregation debate this model still controversially. And some people think provides a good explanation of some phenomena, while others say it's completely off. So, but that's the nature of modeling. So to come back to the issues that we have already seen, it's not just a snapshot of reality. It's not just a description. It's not even just a partial description. You create a parallel system. And you argue in that parallel system, and then you try to re-import some of these insights to reality. And that's when it's often not clear. So, what, oops. what I want to do now is I'll show you a few simulations. Oops. So, here is the grid of the city. The grid of the city. And uh, now I can, here I can do the satisfaction threshold. I can choose a very low one, or I can choose a high one. Here I can choose the initial ratio of the two kinds. So the O people are blue and the X people are red here. So that's how the graphics Work. So you can choose the number of the empty slots, which is exactly the point you made. You can have a lot of empty, you can have less empty. I can choose the grid size between 50 times 50 or small, so let's have it fairly large. And then I can choose the, the delay time, so let's have that somewhere in the middle for now, and let's start. And you see you started a completely random distribution. And after a little moment, you see how clusters emerge. And so that's reached a stable point. You now see if you put the satisfaction threshold up, so people 
we are getting more liberal. Then you see it sort of on clusters. And now you can up, you can say they're, they're very they're very difficult, so they You see again, you get more clustering. It's not stable here now. Switches back and forth. Put it again in the middle. So you can toy around with this. And uh, can you you see the web link top? So you can go to the website. So I'm just downloading this online. So it's nothing special. So here we go. So what the simulation shows is that when you start with a originally random distribution of agents that leads to clusters, so which means that the city becomes more segregated. And the moral that's generally taken away from the Schelling model is that a, only a small preference to live with people like yourself can lead to segregation in a city. So you can now ask the same question as in the Fibonacci model. So you can ask, well, what representation relation does it have? In what way does this model represent what happens in Rome, say? What's the ontology? When you talk about the model, what are you talking about? Are you talking about the stuff that flickers at the screen? Are you talking about the computer code behind it? Or is it the mathematical equation that feeds into the code? Or is it the modeling assumptions about people, etc., etc.? So you can ask what's true in the model, and obviously here, the computer helps you figuring out what's true in the model, but there's still the philosophical question of what notion of truth is this. How you find out, how does it relate to theory, and how does it relate to other topics in philosophy of science? I mean, particular explanation is a prominent one here. Does the model really explain why you observe social segregation, or does it not? <coughs> I mean, again, there's no right or wrong. I mean, different people come into this from different angles, give different answers, but it is a philosophical problem. So, so what, I, what I try to do here is basically motivate you that there are sort of interesting problems here. I'm not trying to give you the right answer to this problem. That would hardly be philosophy. So, um, but there are real issues here to worry about. So, let's now worry a little bit about models and theories. And I want to distinguish here between three kinds of models. So I want to distinguish between models of phenomena, models of theory, and models of data. I mean, you can, of course, classify models in many ways and different orders do this in different ways. But I find this a very helpful way of slicing up the cake. And I want to introduce these three. And I want to make a strong point that it's really imperative not to conflate these, these concepts. However, it's also important to observe, and I come back to this point later with examples, that this is a conceptual distinction. This is not to say that you can take any given model and it clearly falls in one and only one of those groups. So given models can be both models of phenomena and models of theory. For instance, one should just not assume that because something is a model, it does all the things at once. I think that, that's the point I want to drive home. So models of phenomena 
are effectively the kinds of models you've seen so far, the Fibonacci model, the Schelling model. So these models are meant to represent a selected aspect or part of the world, which is typically referred to as the target system of the model. So in the case of Fibonacci, the target system was a population of rabbits. In the case of the Schelling model, the target model is, oh, sorry, the target system is the population in a city. And you can continue here, so that the billiard ball model of a gas, I mean, quite often if you look at the names, of models, you already find an indication of what the target system is. So you have the billiard ball model of a gas, so gases are the target system of these models. The Bohr model of the atom, so the target system is the atom. The Lorentz model of the atmosphere, the lot cobaltera model of, of predator-prey interaction. So you, you see, you find the indications often in the names of the model. And the central issue here is representation. So when models are qualified as models of phenomena, you have to ask, well, how do they represent? And that leads into the entire long and intertwined discussion about scientific representation. Um, when you hear words like a model being a replica or a scale model or an idealized model or an analog model. So you're effectively talking about representational relations. So these are qualifications of how a model relates to reality. Um, since you have seen many examples of these models and have at least an intuitive grip of what's going on, so I don't want to spend much time on that, to say very quickly something about representation at the end, I want to come a bit to theories. So, some models are models in the sense of logic, and uh, I think this is an important thing to say because this is a course of logic, if I yeah. uh, gathered that correctly. So I want to connect what I've been talking about now to issues you will see in, in logic, where you also talk about models. In fact, there's an entire branch of uh, uh, logic that under, goes under the name of model theory, where you hear a lot about models. And they are not exactly the same kind of models, so I want to get clear on how they're different and how it works. So the main idea here is that if, if you say a model is a model of a theory, that the model is a structure that makes all the sentences of a theory true. That's the main idea. And then the theory is taken to be a set of sentences in a formal language, usually in the case of logic. Let's give you a simple example that may sound, sound a bit abstract. So just say my theory is very simple. My theory T says that for all x, if, if x has property f, then x has property g. So that is my, my theory. So now, what would be a model of that theory? Let's just go through the room and gather all the objects in the room and dump them in a set. Just I see if there were 100, it <laughs> doesn't matter. So just put all objects in this room in a set and say that's the set S. Then observe that all objects in the room have mass. All objects are subject to gravity. That's why you're all sitting on your chair and not floating somewhere in the room. And then we say F, as it appears here in the theory, is the predicate has mass. And G, as it appears here, is the predicate, is subject to gravity. And then the sentence, for all x, if x has property f, then x has property G, is true in that set, because all the objects in the room have the requisite property. So we can take a set of objects, we inter interpret the symbols in the theory in a particular way, and if that turns out to be true, then the objects in this room um, are a model of that theory. You can change the example a bit and it's no longer a, a model, so, it's, so this is not entirely trivial. You can say S is the set of all the people and you say that um, F is sitting on a chair and G is wearing a green shirt. 
And then the theory would say, for all people in this room, if they sit on a chair, they wear a green shirt. Well, that's quite obviously wrong. Few people wear green shirts. So you see, if you interpret your symbols differently, and you pick different properties, the people in the room are no longer a model of your theory. So that is the basic idea. So you find a set of objects that makes the statement of a theory true. That's the notion of a model that's at work in formal logic. And when you, you can then formulate that more carefully, but I was trying to give you the intuition. And if this sort of people's and chairs and shirts is a bit too frivolous, so the series examples here. So Euclidean geometry, for instance, can be understood as a set of axioms making all kinds of very general station statements. For instance, any two points can be joined by a straight line. It's one of the axioms of Euclidean geometry. And then you can start finding objects that satisfy these axioms. And whatever object you find of which the axioms of Euclidean geometry are true is then a model of Euclidean geometry. Or close to what physicists do most of the time, at least theoretical physicists, to try to solve equations. <laughs> and from a logical point of view, that's just trying to find a model to the equation. So you take the Schrodinger equation, the main equation of non-relativistic quantum mechanics, you write that down for a particular situation, and then you find, uh, try to find functions such that the equation is true of the functions. So from a formal point of view, you look for a model of the Schrodinger equation. So the structure, just to repeat the point, is a model in the sense that the model is what the theory is about. So that's really the crucial point. So sometimes it's said that logical models are sort of the interpretation of the theory or they satisfy the theory. That's merely different ways of speaking, so that's fine. But important is that the model is the object that the theory is describing. And I bang on on this because it doesn't follow, at least by itself, that the model is then also about something else. So models of theories need not be models of phenomena in the sense that we have seen before. So the people in the room are a model of the theory that all gravitational objects, so sorry, all objects that have mass are subject to gravity, but people in the room don't represent anything else. So they are a model of a theory, but they're not a model of a phenomenon them, themselves. So models in the logical sense are not ipso facto models of phenomena, they're two different notions. Now conversely, models of phenomena need not ipso facto be models of series. For instance, Fibonacci's and Schelling's models, they had very little, if anything, to do with theory. That's obviously how I chose them, because you, you can introduce them very quickly without having to introduce a complicated theory first. <laughs> Um, but at least in that regard, they were not representative of models in general because models of phenomena can at the same time be models of theories. In fact, Mary Hesse in her influential book on models, 1967, has pointed out that many models in science are both models of theory and models of phenomena. They are at once the interpretation of a general formal theory, and they stand for something else in the world. But, so again, coming back to the conceptual point, that doesn't mean that being a model of phenomena, being a model of theory are the same thing. The concepts are clearly distinct. It just means that the same model can be a model in both senses at the same time. And an example is Newton's model of the planetary system. <coughs> Those who've done first year physics, or even in high school, you may have seen that. So Newton constructed a model of the planetary system, and he did similar things that we did before. He assumed that uh, both the sun and the planet are perfect spheres. They have a homogeneous mass distribution. 
gravity between the planet and the sun is the only force that acts. So uh, the planet and the sun are, are gravitationally isolated from the rest of the universe. That's a bit like assuming that rabbits don't die, because it never happens. Uh, so that's a Newtonian model. So that thing then satisfies Newton's equation, or a special version of Newton's equation. So it's a model of Newtonian theory in that sense. And it's at the same time a model of a phenomenon, because it represents the planetary system. So here is a case of a simple model that has this sort of dual structure. However, not every model has such a neat connection to theory. We've seen models that have no connection to theory at all. And then, sort of what the debate about models in the 1990s and early 2000s in particular has focused on is models that have a very messy relation to theory. Nancy Cartwright famously discusses models of a laser, for instance, and says that, look, there's no such thing as a simple relation between that laser model and any sort of theory. So it's not like Newton, where you have a general theory and the model is neatly a, a model of theory in the sense we discussed. When you look at laser models, there are many different theories used sort of in a hodgepodge way. You throw a bit of relativity, a bit of quantum theory, a bit of condensed matter physics in a pot and you stir. And what you get is something that's not at all a neat version of a model of theory. And similar points have been made by Margie Morrison about hydrodynamical models, Wendy Parker about climate models, etc. And a lot of the discussion about models is exactly about that complicated relation with theory. But rather than delving in deeper here, I want to introduce the third type of model. And this is what's generally called models of data. So empirical observation often provides uh, evidence in form of data points. You measure something. And then a data model, I'm trying to circumscribe that, can be said to be a rectified, regimented, and uh, idealized version of the data we gain from immediate <coughs> observation, which are also called raw data. Now, if this sounds a bit mystical, so here is a simple example. So suppose you sort of do, again, first year physics, you're in the laboratory and you have to measure the pressure and the volume of a gas. So you just have a, have a canister of helium or something in front of you and you, 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 you push a piston in. So you change the volume and you have to measure how the pressure in the gas changes as a function of the of the change in the volume. So you, you, you have here the volume and here the pressure. And you find these data points. So you just, at, at particular instance of time, you take both measurements and if you plot them, you have these curves. And so you have these, these points. And then you say, well, okay, if I want to compare that to something more theoretical meaningfully, so these four points are not very useful. So what you do is you fit the curve through through these points. And this curve is the data model. And just a, a remark aside, sort of the problem of underdetermination bites here very strongly, because why is the red line the right data model and not the blue line? <laughs> so there are many hard problems in connection with data models. So what is the best curve to fit through a given set of points? And traditionally, the construction of data sets is the domain, uh, sorry, of data models is the domain of, of st um, statistics. I mean, I mean, it's not all that statisticians do, of course, but um, so statistical techniques are available to fit curves through, through data points. And that's what statisticians sometimes do. The simplest is curve fitting with the minimum square method, for instance, and there are many others. Uh, if that sounds a bit dull, then there are new methods. So we talk a lot about big data these days. So you have smart algorithms to extract information from data. So from a technical point of view, you could say what these algorithms do is they construct data model. Or in modern climate science, for instance, you have a blurring of the distinction between a model of phenomena and a model of data because observations are so scarce 
that you often use a model to fill the gap between them. So you're not just taking a statistical algorithm fitting fitting a curve to given points. What people do is they actually take a climate model to fit the or to fill the gaps in between the observational algorithms. Oh sorry the observational results. And sort of there you get sort of data that have a bit that have a little bit of observation and a little bit of, of phenomena modeling in it already. But that leads to all kind of um, of interesting methodological questions. So, um, with these preliminaries out of the way, I think I wanted to say a bit more about the problem of ontology, but so I'm flexible here. Do you want to have a break here, or should we continue, or what's the preference? We'll continue. Maybe. Continue? Yeah. Until when should I go and when should we start debating things? Because I have a number of slides to go, but I can cut that short. So okay, okay. It's like should I talk to to twelve? Twelve. So shall I try to finish at twelve? Is that good or? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, quarter twenty minutes. Quarter twenty. Good. Okay. Yeah. Good. So we have the discussion. Good. Good. Okay. So I want to talk a bit more about the ontology of models. I've mentioned the problems already. So what are they? What do you talk about when you talk about the model? Well, some models are physical objects, some are descriptions, set theoretical structure, fictional objects, gerrymandered ontology. This is a whole sort of range of range of options available in the literature. And I want to sort of say a little bit something about each of them. So some models are physical objects. Now the models you've seen today are not like this. They were not physical objects, but some models are physical objects. Can you think of examples of a model as a physical object? Okay. The DNA, the double DNA. The DNA, yeah. If you if you have a, a metal, yeah. The, the original Watson Crick model was sort of a metal construction. I think, yeah, that's a physical model, yeah, for instance. Yeah. Well, here is one of my favorites. Someone. Um, doing economics here. Have you seen that? So this is, it's about a meter and a half wide and about two and a half meter high. That's the Philips Newland machine. Uh, this has a water pump here. These are water pipes. These are reservoirs. So you literally pump water through that thing and that re represents an economy. The money stands for water, the tanks stand for various actors in, in an economy like the central bank or various or the business banks. Uh, there is also, you see here is the foreign sector, so you, you, you can model foreign trade with it. And then you literally, you, have, you let the machine run and you see where the money goes. So that's a, that's a sort of a physical machine. It's absolutely fascinating to see it run. This here. That's not my attempt at making props for horror movies. <laughs> so that's stuff of a Nobel Prize. That's the Kendrew model of Maya Globin. Uh, it's literally a sausage of plasticine that is sort of put on sticks just to put it into position. And he had spectroscopic data that informed the model, but only by building that physical model he could figure out what the geometrical shape in space of Maya Globin was. And that won him, I think, in 1963, the Nobel Prize. So, serious stuff. Um, so that's a material model. Okay. Or, more homely, if you build ships, uh, shipbuilding companies often drag models of the ships through water to see what the hydrodynamical properties are, then it's quite a complicated theoretical exercise to scale this up to the right size. But they gather data here and do similar things with cars when you put them in a wind tunnel sort of to see the aerodynamic properties. All these are material models. Or here, this is uh, C. elegance, a little warm that's often studied by biologists to find out all kind of properties. But you can basically take um, all kind of organisms here that uh, biologists use, they even call them model organisms. Mice, the standardized lab mouse, would be, from a f 
from a functional point of view, that's a material model, because you study the object, you learn something about something else. You first see what's true in the model, you study how, how mice react to certain poisons, say. But then you, you try to say that, well, the, one, the mouse represents something else, because well, usually you, you're not terribly interested in how mice react to poison. You want to know how humans react to the same poison. So you, do you think there's a representation relation there between the properties of the mouse and the properties of humans? Or, or in that context, certain organism function as models. However, I mean, these models are fun. But they don't span the whole class of models. We've already seen two models that aren't physical. I mean, Fibonacci didn't literally have rabbits in his garden. Uh, so many models, to use a wonderful phrase of hackings, are something you hold in your head rather than in your hands. And now the question is, what does that mean? So what sort of thing do we hold in our head? I mean, Bohr's model of the atom is, is a model of that kind. I mean, you, that's something you think about. It's not something you have on your desk. <coughs> now, an obvious um, answer to the question would be, well, models are descriptions. So a model is a more or less stylized description of the relevant target system. And a special version of this view is that models are mathematical equations. So in particular, um, economists seem to refer to equations when they speak of models. That's just an anthropological point. Just when talking to economists, they often sort of get the view that their model is an equation. So that seems to be popular in that corner. For example, the Black-Scholes model of a stock market is typically the Black-Scholes equation or the Mandel-Fleming model of an open economy. Now, this view at least when you sort of probe it philosophically, has a number of problems. The first is model proliferation. You can, of course, re-describe the model in different ways. And you can translate it in a different language, or you can choose different coordinates. If in, 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 in physics, you often use different coordinates to describe situations, which changes your equations completely. And that's the whole point of it. Uh, but if we identify a model with its description or with a particular equation, one has to conclude that every time you re-describe the situation, you get a new model. And that seems to be an unsatisfactory conclusion, because you don't want to say you get a new, new model every time you change your description. Also, it, descriptions seem to have the wrong properties. So models have different properties than descriptions. So the model of the solar system consists of spheres that orbit around a uh, mass with the population in the model consists of rabbits. But that doesn't make sense if you say this of a description. So nothing in a, in a description sort of orbits around something. Vice versa, descriptions have properties that models do not have. But the description can be written in English and consist of 517 words and be printed in red ink. But none of this seems to be quite right <coughs> instead of a model. Now you may say, okay, that's sort of taking the view that models are descriptions slightly too seriously. So what we want to say is something a bit more nuanced, namely, that the model is what the description expresses. So um, the model is the propositional content of the description, or something like that. <coughs> now, that, I think, gestures in the right direction. So, but being philosophers, you've probably come across these things. There's a considerable question about what is propositional content and how to analyze the notion that uh, a model is what the model description expresses. So more work has to be done. And one way to go here is to go for, for, the, for the fiction view that I will mention later. So that's one way of making good at this. But it's not the only one. One can be a structuralist. That's a very popular view currently in philosophy of science. So the core idea here is that a model is a mathematical structure and it represents a target system by being isomorphic to the target. 
And proponents here include famous people like Soupies, Francoise and Da Costa, French, Ladyman, Sneed, Stegmuller, and the list could be continued. So that deserves to be taken seriously. So here is a bit of more detail about this. So if you say that a model is a mathematical structure and it represents by isomorphism, we have to say what that means. And probably you will come across mathematical structures at some point in the course. Have you introduced structures no, already? No? OK, so here is a simple version. You can do it in all, all detail. So the basic idea is that a structure is a non-empty set U of individuals called the domain or universe of the structure that might U, and a non-empty set R of relations on U. And it's often convenient to write the, the a structure as a tuple, so you can say a structure <coughs> S is just the ordered tuple of U and R, which is the universe and the relations. A simple example is you have the universe with three objects, A, B, and C, and you have the relation that holds between A, B, B, C, and A, C. It's a transitive relation, and the structure is just a collection of the two. <coughs> and if sort of that A, B, C notation makes you somewhat nervous, then you're up to something. So an important thing is that if you understand structures in mathematical logic, you're basically bracketing completely what things intrinsically are. So nothing about what the object are matters for the definition of a structure. So you basically strip away the material nature from the individuals in the domain of the structure and replace them by pure dummy objects. So, I mean, there can be people, there can be cars, there can be superstrings, there can be whatever. None of it matters in any way. All you care about is that there is something. So, so that's why it's convenient to just write A, B, C. So if you want a wonderful account of this, um, Russell's introduction to philosophical logic, 1919, chapter 4. It's, it's a very good discussion of this point, so I would recommend that. Um, the same goes for the operations or the relations in the domain. So they are defined purely extensionally. So it just matters that the relation holds between A and B. So it doesn't matter whether the relation is being farther off, being gravitationally attracted by, being more expensive than, or being heavier than. Nothing of this matters. From a structural point of view, all that matters is that there is a relation that is such that A and B enter in that relation. So you can just strip the entire content away as it were. Now, with this in place, the crucial move is to say that models in mathematics and models in science are exactly the same. So the claim would be that structures in that sense are what scientific models are. Soupies announced that famously in 1960, so the meaning of the concept of a model is the same in mathematics and the empirical sciences. And from Frassen, come almost 40 years later, according to the semantic approach to scientific series, that is, to present the scientific series, to present the family of models, that is, mathematical, is mathematical structures offered for the representation of the series subject matter. So this view has been entertained very seriously. So let's just now say what isomorphism is. So let's take two structures and then the structure S1 here and the structure S2 here. They are isomorphic if there's a mapping from S1 to S2 such that F is 1 to 1. And I'm not going to read out this condition here but basically the idea is that it preserves the set of relations in the sense that if two of the individuals in the domain of the first structure enter into a certain relation, you map them onto other individuals in the second structure, they have to enter into the parallel relation of the other structure. So that's the main idea. In effect, you preserve the relational system over the individuals under the mapping. And the core idea of structuralism that representation is isomorphism between model and the target. So that, that, that's why you introduce the whole machinery. So if the model is a mathematical structure, the target system is a bit in the world, social, social systems of the city of Rome, and you set up an isomorphism 
between the two, and that's what representation is. So that's the view. Now, a few issues with this. Um, there is the issue of descriptive accuracy, which means that it doesn't quite seem to sit all that well with scientific practice. Scientists often talk about model systems as if they were physical things or something different from mathematical structures at any rate. So Newton, when introducing his model of the planetary system, did not just write down a mathematical structure of this kind. So he described the hypothetical situation with particular spheres and you know, gravitation doing something in particular. So there is at least an open question how this squares with this structuralist view. There is also a heuristic problem. So to understand what sort of scenario to consider when you do the model. Remember again the Fibonacci model or the social segregation model. We, we're talking about situations where you only have two social actors or where rabbits never die. It's very important, A, to, to get to the equation in the first place, and B, to assess, that was your point earlier, the range of validity. So if you want to understand how far the Fibonacci model stretches, we have to know what kind of system the equation is, is true of. And if we know that the equation is true only of a population when, when no individual ever dies, that's very important information, but that's not part of the structure. So that's a, information about the structure that comes from outside. And if you say the model is nothing but the structure, you seem to lose that information. And also, heuristically, when you want to improve the model, it's important to know these things. Finally, um, representation. Um, the view here is that isomorphism is what representation amounts to. One could talk long, long about this, but that doesn't seem to be a very successful approach to representation, because representation in reality is much more complicated than isomorphism. You just again think about the social segregation model and the Fibonacci model. If you just want to set up an isomorphism between that model and something in the world, you'd probably have to be hard pressed to do that successfully. So representation, it seems, has to be explained in different terms. One way to avoid that is to, uh, to say that models are the fictional objects, uh, like Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> So the, the descriptions we give, like when we say, sort of assume we have a rabbit, that's the pairs, uh, male and the female, etc., etc., you go through all the motions that you did at the end, you in effect describe a fictional entity just as um, Common Doyle did when he describes Sherlock Holmes. But this idea has been nicely expressed in a paper by Peter Godfrey Smith about a decade ago. So he says, I take at face value the fact that modelers often take themselves to be describing imaginary biological populations, imaginary neural networks, or imaginary economies, although these imagined entities are puzzling, I suggest that at least much of the time they might be treated as similar to something that we're all familiar with, the imagined objects of literary fictions. Here I have in mind entities like Sherlock Holmes, London, and Tolkien's Middle Earth, the model system of science often works similarly to these familiar fictions. So that's the main idea here. Um, that's a good idea, sort of I like this, I put my cards on the table here. <laughs> but that does obviously not mean that there are no problems here. Again, those who've done the philosophy of language or metaphysics will know that um, fictional entities are beset with very serious philosophical problems. You have to say a lot about what they are and how they work to make them good on this. But if you want just one answer to this, you can look at my 2010 paper that's on my website and so you see how I would solve these conundrums. So at least how I would respond to the challenges, whether that's convincing or not, it's another question. Very quickly about representation. I could have talked a lot about representation today, but I saw the ontological issue is maybe more interesting in particular because it relates more to logic, which is what the course is about. Um, if that frustrates you, so um, I have a remedy to offer. Uh, just last week, 
an article of representation came out in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. It's written by my co-author James Nguyen and myself. So Stanford Encyclopedia is openly accessible. You can just go there and get it. It's on the scientific representation. And you can read more about how representation would and would not work. We, we sort of go through all the all the available accounts, <coughs> hopefully as neutrally as we can. I mean, one can never be completely neutral, of course. I mean, we come from somewhere to this. But so you, you find discussion of isomorphism and similarity and fictionalist views and Gricean views and all that. So, so I would simply refer you to, to that if you're interested in representation and sort of in the interest of getting some questions done. I say thank you very much for listening. person has a, of the world as a model of the world and the world as a target and with the knowledge as a model of, uh, of the world. So you think that it's possible to have a model of the entire world? No, no, um, to, consi to consider the idea that every person, that a person has of the world as a model of uh, the world. The knowledge of a person is a model for the, the world in which is the target. Um, yes and no. Um, so, yes, because look, it, we all hold beliefs about the world. Some of them are right and some of them are wrong. Um, in that, so, here is an analogy with, say, the Fibonacci model of the population. However, I think it is a crucial aspect of modeling that A, you're aware of your assumptions, and B, that you use your assumptions to generate further truths. So Fibonacci didn't just go, go out and say, oh, I think rabbits um, uh, breed in six months rhythms, that's it. So he went away and generated predictions. And sort of he teased out consequences from these beliefs that he didn't have before. And he used the sort of a the mathematical mechanism that he enshrined into the model to, to do that. I'm not sure we all do that with our beliefs of the world. So I think what we believe about the world is slightly too big to be called a model. So I would say models are typically also more, more local. You have a model of population growth, so you have a model of the hydrogen atom. You don't have just a model of the world or matter as such. So, so I would qualify this in this way. Um, does that does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I have a follow-up question yeah. on this. Given that you highlighted, maybe I'm mixing up thing things, but it seemed to me that you highlighted the problem that there are. Uh, inexplicit assumptions built into certain models. Mm -hmm. Do I remember that correctly? There are there are implicit assumptions. Impl implicit assumptions. So, so how can you decide upon the scope and the number of the implicit assumptions? I mean, one, one way to press the question here would be, well, why not say that maybe the potential number of implicit assumptions is considerable and it might amount even to a worldview. I'm not saying that that's a view I'm having. I'm just saying how to resist this. Yeah, I think the term implicit assumption is somewhat dangerous because it can mean two different yeah. things. I mean, there may be modeling assumptions that you're making and you, you, you're not aware of. Uh, that's one kind of implicit assumption. So ideally, you minimize these. So ideally, you know as much as possible about your modeling or something. So if someone uses the Fibonacci model and doesn't realize that the rabbits never die, I mean, that person seriously misunderstands his model. 
So there is that implicit assumption of the second type. This is what, speaking in logical terms, one could call logical consequences of the basic assumptions. So that, now I have to check which, which year it was. I always forget this. So after how many years you get 144 rabbits? Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 12. So you, the model implies that after 12 breeding cycles, you have 144 rabbits. That, that wouldn't call an implicit assumption. That's a consequence of the model. And I think, as in logic, we never know all the implications of a theory. I mean, I, if you're a logician, you have this convenient thing called the deductive closure of the theory. Yeah. You just write it down. But in practice, we are not omniscient, so we never know. And there is always the possibility that the model has consequences we don't know. But that's a good thing. That's how we learn. And important scientific progress has been made by realizing that. So one of the episodes is when the Newtonian model was slightly extended, and rather than looking only at um, two objects, you look at three. That's what Darwin Poincaré did. And Poincaré asked, well, what happens if you have three gravitational bodies spinning around each other? And then Poincaré realized that the assumption that small variation, I mean, initial conditions just create small variations in the orbit. Is, is wrong, and that effectively was the discovery of chaos. It's an interesting historical question that the Poincaré really discovered chaos, or whether it was Lorentz 60 years later. But so, this, to come back to the framework here, is the discovery of an implication or a fact in the model that has not been noticed before. And I think it's wonderful that models have this sort of implicit assumption, or rather, for to say consequences, because that shows how fruitful it is to study models. Because if you only get out of the models what you put in, sort of in a straightforward way, modeling would not be an interesting thing. <coughs> so, so it's only because models are complex and the assumptions interact with, with each other in a complex manner, you get interesting consequences out. <coughs> I have a question about uh, Tom Schelling's uh, uh, so, um, social segregation uh, um, uh, model. Yeah. Uh, if we uh, take different agent, agents and we uh, satisfy them, are they going to um, like uh, um, being calculated singularly so we can have uh, um, uh, integration of each person. I mean, if I like red and I like to live uh, close to, to people who ones. like red, yeah. if and I'm black and I like to live close to black people, mm -hmm. if we take different agent, uh, agents and we um, calculate a satisfaction threshold, we can possibly reach a situation with, uh, where we will have a uh, Global integration between people which look like look completely different, or we are going to um, make it difficult here to reach the satisfaction threshold. Yeah, look, uh, you can change this model in a million ways, and there is an entire discipline who does uh, agent-based modeling. So I mean, this is just the simplest of the examples. Yeah. So you can. You can vary these and you can change the assumption, you can toy around with it. I mean, it's an entire industry these days. And obviously you can create agents that um, have preferences such that you reach maximum mixing. I mean, if you say you have an agent that has what one could call the pluralism preference and who wants to live next to people that are not like themselves, oh, okay. your, your result will be completely different. So, I mean, I think Schelling, to be fair to him, set out just to ask the question. Look, de facto, you do observe segregation. Cities tend to segregate, in particular in the United States. I mean, they're more than here in Europe. However, not everybody is a blatant racist. How is it that it, we do observe segregation and not everybody is a racist. How does this go together? At least prima facie, there seems to be a contradiction. And what the model is designed to do is to give you an explanation 
how, sort of in a society where you just have mild preferences for likeness, uh, you get segregation without sort of glaring racism. But obviously, if you change the assumption that people have a preference to be with like people, things look completely different. So you can uh, even assume that um, uh, a dictator could use this model to justify his uh, particular political assets to overcome other people's will, saying, I'm spreading a particular liking stan standard, so you have to keep it so everyone will live close to each other, even if we are all different. And so people will be... Um, completely uh, not... Yeah, people gone. can be complicit in that yeah. without wanting to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, if you have a political ideology where the other is demonized, um, I'm experiencing that in the country where I live at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, you get to a point where society segregates. I, so I don't think that everybody who wants Brexit is a racist, but they <laughs> think that that the British people should live their own life. <laughs> so, and that will eventually lead to a, to, a, to a segregation, possibly not exactly as I described it. While if you have sort of a multicultural ideology where you celebrate being different, and you celebrate difference, and you see it as an asset if your neighbor is completely different like you, you will get a totally different pattern. Yes, I mean, political regimes can use this mechanism, I mean, if the mechanism is at work, if people really move house as the model says it does, if political forces could use this mechanism to create segregated neighborhoods, I mean, if they think this is a good thing to have. Yeah. I mean, that's right. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'd like to give you a question. Uh, I'm not sure I understood the difference between uh, models of phenomena and models of data. I was thinking about, for example, Fibonacci model, no? Mm -hmm. So, could we see it also as a, a model of data that, uh, for example, we see the growth population of rabbits or uh, any kind of animals mm -hmm. in, in time? Uh, no, for, it, for example, we don't see, uh, uh, we're not looking at all the gaps. Of, um, I see them, uh, as they're very close. Uh, or you just uh, misunderstand? I'm, I'm not sure. No, I no, get, you, you, you I'm not sure. I get uh, the point. Uh, you're putting your finger on a good point. Yeah. Um, so, 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 how make the distinction between uh, models of phenomena, and models of data? When we get, for example, models of phenomena, uh, equations or uh, algorithms. Uh, no, I'm not sure. The, the idea of a model of data is really that the data are real data. They're not mm. computer outputs, and they're not the outputs of your calculation. This is what you observe. But when you okay. So Fibonacci would have model would have had a model of data if he literally had rabbits in his back garden, mm. and once every six months he goes down and counts okay. how many rabbit pairs he has and he puts them on a okay. on a chart, and that's in fact what what the National Bureau of Statistics does when you have a census. So each household in the country gets a questionnaire and this has to say, how, how, how many people live in your flat? Mm. So in effect, that is getting data. And then when the National Bureau of Statistics sort of takes the data from 10 years ago and five years ago and now and puts a curve through it, that's a data model. So the data model is really sort of a smooth mathematical description of actual observations, real data, something you've counted empirically. Now, where your question comes from, I understand. So is, so theoretical models also give you curves. So you can derive a curve from Fibonacci's model. The difference is that Fibonacci didn't model this on data. He didn't count rabbits. He just said, let's make assumptions. He constructed a theoretical model of population growth by saying, let's assume the rabbits breed in six months intervals. They always have one pair of offspring, etc., etc." And he, he then, under these assumptions, calculated the 
the population grows. I mean, that's a model of a phenomenon in the sense that the modeling assumptions or the mathematical equation you get is supposed to be a model of the growth of a population, but it's theoretically derived. It's not derived from data. And obviously what you do in an empirical methodology, you start comparing the curves. So if you reinterpret this for a second, right, the curve doesn't match because obviously few people know this. this. So if you say this would be time, this would be a rabbit pair numbers. So we start with one, one, two, three, five, you go on. So you would get sort of data points. But then you go out and count your real rabbits, then you can see how close the two curves are. But that's exactly what you do when you check how good your model is. And what you would find is that the model works relatively very well for short time spans and it becomes dramatically false yeah. for longer lead times. Which is what often happens in models, that the assumptions are quite good for short times and they're quite wrong for long times. Does that put the yeah, 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 sure, perspective? Sure. Okay. Reason. I have a question. Which general assumption do you do you need to choose a certain object as a model? Between I for example I would like to use a C elegance or maybe another small animal as my subject of study. It's a very good point. I don't think there is any general principle to choose. So that this is where the creative genius of scientists comes in, you just pick a certain entity because you think you can handle the entity, you think you can set up a representation relation that's close enough for your purposes, you know how to do calculations on the object. I mean, if you have a population model that has 37 variables and 150 parameters, you can't do anything with it. So. So it's, um, I think that is really where the true genius of, of a scientist comes in, that they pick something. Janet Schelling had this idea with the, with the checkerboard. I mean, okay, why a checkerboard? <laughs> There's nothing intrinsic in checkerboards that makes them social segregation representations. And that is just where someone has a great idea. And the, what justifies it is this, this this nice saying in English, the proof of the pudding is the eating. So you can just do something interesting with a model or you can't. And probably many models have been proposed and they don't work. And because you can't handle the equations, you can't derive any interesting predictions, etc. And then you just throw it away. It's really, that's, I think, where creativity truly enters the scene. Oh man, I think there are absolutely no restrictions. I mean, there's no in principle restriction. I mean, you can take anything to, to be a model of absolutely anything else in principle. The question is just whether you can make it work. I mean, you can say, let this model the universe, and then you say, yeah, sure. <laughs> but what representation relation is there between the universe? What intrinsic properties does this thing have that you can use to model properties of the universe, etc.? So that is just not an interesting model of the universe, but nothing precludes me in principle to use this to model the universe. So uh, the challenge is really to find something that's interesting enough to give you something and still be workable. So it's the slogan that science is the art of the feasible. So that's really what's playing in very, very strongly. Okay, I have just a brief question yeah. about uh, the connection between models and theory. Mm -hmm. Maybe it is on the background of your talk. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I'm thinking obviously of, for example, Nancy Cartwright, you. Mm -hmm who said that science has to do main with models and with theories. Yeah. I'm curious about your, your viewpoint of this connection. What's your thought about uh, the role of models and the connection with theories? If you have a 
simple answer. I don't know. Well, I see I'm always getting a bit nervous when people want to have sort of overarching views yeah. on this. So, well, overarching views are nice if they can be had, but often they can't. And so, I think Cartwright is entirely right about the model she describes. I mean, when you look at these laser models, it's just yeah. true that there is no such thing as laser theory that you then specify in a number of ways and then you get the laser model that the laser model represents that real thing I have here that has a little laser in it. Yeah. Um, it's true that laser models are a messy cocktail of many theoretical assumptions and what's doing the representing is the laser model, it's not the laser theory. But it's also true that some theoretical contexts are much neater than that. So Newtonian mechanics, so the so Newtonian model of the solar system I think is a good example of a relatively clean application of theory. We start with general Newtonian principle, you just plug the specifics of the situation into it and you get the, the model. I mean, you, you don't get it in an algorithmical way. I mean, Newton had to come up with the idea of using perfect spheres. I mean, if you just see a bright spot on the sky, I mean, that's not suggesting in any obvious way that this should be a perfect sphere. So, so again, I mean, it was one of the act of genius of Newton say, okay, let's assume these are all perfect spheres, and then you could show that if you apply his equation to perfect spheres, then you, you get a version of the equation that you can actually solve analytically. Uh, I mean, you don't do that lightly. So. <laughs> but, but this seems to me that this is, a, this is an example of relatively neat connection between theory and mm -hmm. model. What I do agree with is that at least in these physics cases, I mean, I, oh, I can't talk about everything. Biology is probably very different. But at least in, in physics, the application of theory to the world, I mean, even if it's neat like in Newton, is mediated by models. And uh, so models play a crucial role. If you want to understand how a theory is brought to the world, then you have a model somewhere. And if you understand that and understand how models works is important because I mean, I mean even in the neat cases like Newton you have to model the two planets or the sun and the planet as perfect spheres and you have to assume that they're gravitationally insulated etc. You can't apply Newton's equation to the universe just as it is. So models are crucial there and so we have to understand how models work. I think that's the point where I, where I profoundly agree with, with her. But a theory application is always as messy as in the laser. I think that's a map, that's a factual question. There's no no no, no point philosophizing about it. You just have to look at the cases. And when Nancy Carter is surely right in pointing out that theory application is often much messier than we thought it was if we just look at these cases like me. Mm -hmm. oh, no, does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Uh, is uh, our knowledge not only uh, scientific knowledge but uh, uh, our everyday life knowledge a uh, modelization of reality? I mean, what do you have in mind? I mean, I can think of very a many aspects of everyday knowledge. Um, um, well, again, I'm some sense I'm tempted to say yes and some no. I mean I don't want to be this sort of an imperialist and see models absolutely everywhere. So I don't think all scientific reasoning is model-based reasoning. I mean there are other aspects of it and it's all in everyday life. But say so if I have a view about how my family works and how the various actors in it behave in certain situations and on on the basis of that knowledge, I predict what happens at Christmas, <laughs> and, and I develop um, coping strategies. <laughs> um, so, yeah, in a sense, I can say I I have an agent-based model of my family, where my 
my, my, my mother-in-law does something, and my mother does something, and my brother does something, and if I have a view how these agents interact, and if I, so if, if you want, you can call this a model. Um, I'd be happy with that. I, I'm just not sure it's a productive way of speaking. So uh, they, there's always a tendency, if you like something, you try to see it everywhere. And sort of, I want to resist that to some extent. Sort of, I mean, models are great, but the world doesn't have to consist only of models. And, uh, so otherwise, I end up like Stephen Wolfram, who studied cellular automata in great detail. And he thinks literally the world is a, is a cellular automaton. And, uh, I do find that mildly plausible. <laughs> Perhaps we can stop here. Yeah, 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 we have to leave the room. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. 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 Th